All right. Well, take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter number 2 tonight. Ephesians chapter number 2. We got through some things about the, uh, the love of God in verse number 4. Hopefully y'all are having a decent work week this week. I know, like I say, uh, Wednesday night sometimes it's, dr- it's hard just to get to church, isn't it? Especially when it's like gray and gloomy outside, that kind of thing. But y'all fought the weather and got here anyway. So hopefully the Lord have something for you here tonight. But we did get through some stuff about the love of God. And verse 4 where he says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. And we talked about uh, God's love toward us, and that was uh, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and that, uh, and then also our love towards Him. And then, and as He said in First uh, John chapter four, how the evidence that we love God is that we love one another, and our unity uh, uh, amongst the brethren. And we went in and see what charity looked like there in First uh, Corinthians chapter thirteen. And some of those things, I got to thinking about it after we were done, and some of those things, are they're hard truths, but again, those are truths nonetheless. And it, it allows us to understand what it actually means to love somebody. And uh, a lot of times, I think that we get, uh, we get a little mixed up. We think, that, we think that just by, you know, acknowledging someone's existence, <laughs> that that means that we love them. Uh, but it, it goes a lot deeper than that, and that's why he gives us 16 things over there in 1 Corinthians 13 to think about when it comes to charity. We went over those. And uh, we also, a couple weeks ago, uh, when we were t- uh, right, right before um, Resurrection Sunday, we hit verse 5. Even when you were dead in sins, uh, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. And that quickening is mentioned uh, multiple times throughout the Scriptures and Paul's writings. And uh, this is, uh, this is a definitely a, res- uh, uh, a reference to the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a cross-reference. We've been there to 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, and we, uh, we talked about uh, the power of His resurrection. And so we're going to go ahead and jump off into verse number 6. And hath raised us up uh, together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Lord, again, we come to you tonight thankful for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for everybody that came out. Undoubtedly, Lord, they came here to hear from you, and I pray that they, they will. God, I pray, God, that you'd wash me in the blood and get me out of the way and help me to maybe uh, just convey a couple thoughts here as we've uh, studied uh, this, this passage, Lord, and, and start going through this book. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just get all the, the glory and, Lord, that the Word of God would open up to us and give us some help here tonight. Give us something to chew on, Lord, something to think about, and feed our souls. And we ask this now in this time, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so he says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, we've gone over this when we did the introduction to the book of Ephesians, in that the multiple times where it talks about us being seated together uh, in heavenly places, we talked about the difference in sitting and walking and standing, uh, we went through that. But uh, again, to just to reemphasize what he's saying here, he hath raised us up together and made us sit together uh, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice where what our where our position is, and that's in Christ. Okay, it's important to get that because anything that comes out of um, uh, and we'll touch a couple things on Calvinist stuff uh, tonight, but. Uh, for the most part here, we know that the context of those things, whether it be um, uh, being ordained or predestinated or uh, anything like that, before the foundation of the world, all these buzzwords and buzz terms, we know that those things are, are in the context of being in Christ. Right. And so uh, without you being in Christ, the only place you're predestinated to go to is hell. Uh, and that's a decision that you make because you reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's just Uh, as clear as day in the scriptures. Uh, But he says here, this is also a verse that shows us uh, a light into our eternal security. Notice that he says that we're seated, we're we're, uh, made us to sit together in heavenly places. Now to to sit, that's a place of security. That's a position of security. I'm not, that's not a, that's not, that's not a standing position and that's not a walking position. 
Those are, those are positions that take effort on your part. It takes effort for you to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that? You know, some, you ever been at a wedding and uh, you see somebody lock their knees, they're standing there for a while, and all of a sudden they get real pale and they start to, they start to do one of these? I remember at my wedding, uh, I had a buddy of mine, he was, uh, I think he was my best man. I'm not going to say his name, but anyways, uh, <laughs> he was standing there, and I remember the preacher, he was going a little bit long <laughs> at the wedding, as uh, Baptists tend to do, and uh, I remember him standing there, and he's just sweating bullets, and he's standing there like this, and his legs are locked, his knees are locked, and I'm looking back at him over my shoulder, and I'm like, if you pass out, I'm going to punch you on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, man? And he's like, man, standing up here was rough. You ever felt that way? <laughs> you would think that standing is a relaxing position. If you've never been a cashier or been a, you know, some kind of a teller or something like that where you're standing in a constant, uh, and just uh, uh, constantly throughout the day, and then you come home at night, it feels like you ran a marathon sometime. Your legs are hurting and your back's hurting and everything's hurting. It's like, why is that? All I did was stand. I didn't even move around. Standing takes a lot of effort when you do it for a long period of time. And likewise with walking, you'd think, oh, well, walking, that's no big deal. I'm not exerting as much energy as I am running. Yeah, but you walk for a sustained period of time, and you really, you really get something accomplished there when it comes to working out your lower extremities <laughs> and your lower back and that kind of thing. So standing and walking are positions of effort. And I think that it's not coincidental that in verse number 6, he says that we are seated with Christ. In heavenly places. As in, I have no effort. When you're sitting down, it's like, you know, you've been, you've been standing or you've been walking around. You've been working all day up and down, up and down. And you come home. Anybody here have, like, the chair? I got a dad chair at my house. Unfortunately, everybody thinks it's their chair at my house. And so sometimes I have to share. But, uh, um, I mean, I have, I have the recliner. If any of you have ever been to my house, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've sat in that recliner. You're like, that's the best seat in the house. You sit down in that thing, and it just kind of eats you up. And it's like, it's like the best. You can fall asleep in that moment in that chair because you're just sitting down, and you're at perfect rest. And it's like, man, everything's just a load off, and it's just like this release. It's like, and you relax. You know, that's what your salvation ought to be like. That ought to be like, man, you just come in. Could you imagine one of these days you're already, the Bible says in present tense here in verse 6, he has raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's not past tense, that's present tense. Like right now. Okay, that's again, it's speaking to your eternal security. That means that one of these days I'm going to have walked in this world and I'm going to have stood as long as I can stand. And God's going to call me home. And one of these days, I'm going to get to heaven and meet up with the other part of me that's already up there. And I'm going to take a seat and be like, whoo, it is good to be home. <laughs> and it's going to be like this massive release. Like, man, I'm glad I'm off my feet now. And I got eternity to just hang out with the Lord. Uh, I mean, that's going to be a blessing, man. And I like that stuff. And I look at that verse right there and. I know that there's doctrinal implications, and yeah, you could, you could go off there and throw all kinds of darts at Calvin and everything else, but we'll do that. We have fun doing that. But the fact of the matter is, I look at that sit, and I'm like, ah, I want some of that right there. Yeah. Yeah. You ever uh, hear preachers talk sometimes, and they, and they talk about, you know, if I, could just, if I could just, me and him could just switch places every now and again. I think, the, I think Dr. Ruckman used to say that. He'd say, I know there's a part of me that's up there sitting down. I just wish every now and again, Lord, let us switch spots. <laughs> And let me get a chance to go up there and see it and then come back like Paul did. Paul, Paul's cheater. You know, he got to see it. <laughs> and he had to come back. That's why he was so suicidal after he came back, man. <laughs> I was like, I'll go back into the city. You want me to go back into the city if they kill me? That's great because I saw what's on the other side. I'm ready to go sit down for a while. Amen. All right, verse 7. He says, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Notice he says in verse 4 that he's rich in mercy. But in verse number 7, <coughs> he says that he has exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Notice that he's going to show us off someday. You've heard that? We're tokens of his grace. You, read, you, you, have that, you, you, re, you sing that song, 
uh, how he's uh, gathering his jewels, jewels for his crown. And one of these days he's going to set them jewels on display. Say, who is that? A bunch of lively stones that got a hold of something down here on this earth that changed their lives. And the minute you submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him have access to your heart and access to your mind and access to your will and access to your life, you realize something real quick. He can shine you up and take care of you and pull you out of the muck and the mire and wipe you down and shine you up. Why is that? Because one of these days, he's going to, in the ages to come, show you the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness. How is he going to show his, the riches of his grace and his kindness towards you for all eternity? Look at this group of Gentile dogs. Can you, you ever, man, you ever read over there in Ezekiel? I think it's Ezekiel chapter 16. And they give that horrible illustration of, a, of a, basically a, a, an aborted fetus or, or one that was just uh, uh, barely born. And, and the Bible says that he's, that he's polluted in his own blood, was cast into a field and left to die. Polluted in his own blood. And the Lord comes by and sees that little baby and sees the crying and the hopelessness and the helplessness of that little child and the fact that it's covered in its own mess and covered in its own muck and nobody's there to help it. You know what he does? He reaches down and he grabs that little baby and he starts to wipe it off and clean it up and put new clothes on it and, 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 and give this thing a life that it never had a chance to have. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? You say, why is that? Because for all of eternity, he can show. Guess what? These Gentile dogs, they had no business being here. They had no business being here. I didn't even come for them. He came unto his own and his own received him not. And thank God they didn't. Amen. Thank God they didn't. Why? Because that gave us the opportunity to get in, brethren. We got in on something that, well, guess what? It wasn't for us. We're a bunch of dogs without our dogs. And now look at that. What do we do? We sit at the master's table and he just likes to throw stuff off the table to us. We ain't eating from crumbs. <laughs> Amen. And even if it was crumbs, it'd be pretty good crumbs. Hallelujah, man. And for all eternity, can you imagine the Old Testament saying, say, man, who are these guys? Oh, those are the ones that were saved by grace. You say, man, I wish I'd go back to the Old Testament. I could see it. No, you don't. No, you don't. You want to know why? You got a more sure word of prophecy sitting in your lap. You got far more light than those Old Testament saints had, and they could, and they could see the angel of the Lord descend from heaven and pop back up. They could see all the miracles that they saw. Guess what? They're, those miracles are just as viewable and just as believable in this book as they were to them when they were right in front of their faces. Right. And you want to know something? They don't have a clue of what you have access to. They don't have a fragment of what you have access to. And God says, you know what? They didn't see a thing. They just had a book, and they had to follow me by faith. And you know what they did? They showed just like, just like uh, Abraham. That's why he gives Abraham as an illustration so many times in Paul's epistles because Abraham looks up at God and he, he leaves his land and with no direction and the great thing that Abraham had accomplished. He didn't fight any great battles. He didn't do any uh, you know, great escapades and leading the children of Israel into some promised land. He didn't uh, deliver them from, uh, from Egypt. He did nothing of that kind. He said, what did he do? He just walked around. He just walked around underneath the guidance of God. You know what? He says, look up at this. Look up at the stars of heaven. You believe, you believe I can make your seed like the stars of heaven, Abraham? He says, that's awful crazy, Lord. He says, you know what? But I believe you. I got no reason to doubt you. Look how good you've been to me. And he says, all right, I'll count it to you for righteousness. And you know what, one of these last, uh, you know, uh, one time in your life, someone came up to you and says, hey, look up there. You see, that's a, that's a dead Jew on a, on a piece of wood. You believe on him and take your sins away? You know, that's awful crazy. I, I can possibly imagine that that would do anything. But uh, the world thinks I'm crazy. The world says that's insane, that's ludicrous. But you want to know something, Lord? I believe that. And I'll accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. He says, okay. I'll impute to you my righteousness. How about that? What a deal. <laughs> what a deal. And guess what? And you let God, and you give God your life, and you give God your mind and your body and everything else, and you know what? He's just, he's just shining you up. You want to know why? Because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. 
You're a token of His grace. And so he says that in ages to come, He's going to show us the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Verses 8 and 9, if you don't have those two verses memorized and you've been saved longer than two or three years, shame on you. I'm going to put it on you, okay? I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to hurt you or anything, say anything bombastic or mean. But listen, folks, we should take the Bible seriously. These are, some, these are what we would call salient verses to a New Testament Christian uh, when it comes to salvation. And if you don't have these verses memorized, then do yourself a favor and get you a 3 by 5 card and put it on your mirror uh, while you get ready for school or work or wherever it is you're going and memorize these verses by the end of the week. Okay? A little call to action for you right there. Memorize them by the end of the week if you don't have them memorized. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, on the first layer of this, uh, of this understanding of these two verses, we see that the purpose and the reason why he says that you're saved by grace and that not of works is so that no man can boast in the presence of God. Could you imagine if you could get to heaven and you stand before him and you say, well, Lord, look at all the great things that I've done. This is why you should let me into heaven. And then he says, yeah, yeah, I guess you did a pretty good job. Might as well just let you up in here. And then the next guy behind you comes in, right? And he walks in behind you and you say, oh, well, what did you do? Well, I did this. Oh, man, you should have seen what I did. <laughs> you say, why is that? Now you got competition in heaven. He says, uh-uh, absolutely not. And if you pay attention to the way the Old Testament is, uh, uh, is set up, guess what? There's no sense of competition in the Old Testament either. Even with physical sacrifices. Even in physical sacrifices, the Lord never pinned the people against each other to compare and contrast themselves of how good each one of them was. All He did was give them provision for when they messed up, they could get right. And in every dispensation, God makes a way for you to take care of your sins. You know what? That's how you know that salvation in any dispensation was not created by man. Because everything that you see in the world has a level of hierarchy to it. You see it in the secular world. You see it in the business world. You see it in, uh, you see it in any kind of... Uh, any kind of corporation or big company, anything like that. And it's, it's merit-based. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying if it was merit-based and it was, uh, you know, way you're good and your good outweighs your bad, then you're pinning everybody against each other. We call that company culture in the business world. It was funny, a couple of years back when I got my job, uh, they had me coming in and they, had, they didn't even have my department. They wanted to grow the department that they had me in. So they hired me to, to develop a whole different side of the business. So they had primar primarily just did design build stuff. And so they had two design build uh, salesmen. And then they wanted me to come in and sell all the continuing maintenance stuff and, and create that whole side of the business. So, so that's, what I, that's what I do for those of you who didn't know. And when I first got there, we're all commission-based, Right? And what we found is that as we were commission-based, if I got a big lead that came in, right, I, I was new and I was, trying to, I was trying to, you know, be courteous to the other two guys that had been there for, you know, since the company had started. And uh, they didn't want to help me because they don't want to work on something they're not going to get paid on. You see? And then if I sold something, right, they say, well, how come that's not in my department? Because if it was in my department, I could put my name on it, and then they would get paid on it. And, it, and, and what, there's this weird dynamic that, had, that started to grow, right? And then what you find out is that you get what you incentivize. And that's not just in the business world. That's with anything. Okay? You get what you incentivize. And so what we decided a couple years back, and I, and I was one of the ones that did it, because I said, I, I, I would just soon you pay me a fair wage, and I don't have to be in constant competition with everybody around here. Just pay me a fair wage, and let us just do the... That way we can work one with another and, 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 and have some unity in the, in the office. And so we took commissions out. And you want to know something? We've grown exponentially since we've done that. 
You say, what are you trying to tell me tonight? I'm trying to tell you, isn't it funny that uh, the Lord, in no matter any dispensation, when it comes to you taking care of your sins, he's never pinned anybody against each other to compete with one another so that they could say, hey, look at how much greater I am than you. That's how you know God did it, because it's not in man to do that. Man wants to be in competition one with another. They are envious one against another. That's why the first murder in your Bible was done the way it was done, because it's in your nature. And so what does God do? He puts a plan in place that's against the nature of man. Why do you think people have such a hard time with a free gift of salvation? Why in the world is some, why would somebody even argue with that point? It's the greatest deal that you could possibly accept. But you want to know something? They overcomplicate it because they can't understand something they don't have to work for. But the Lord knows if you put a price tag on it, guess what? Somebody couldn't afford it. And if you put a level of education to get it, somebody couldn't figure it out. And so to solve that problem, you know what he did? I'll just make it free. <laughs> I'll just make it so that the lowliest, lowliest person can... It's so simple that the lowliest person could understand it. And he opened it up to everybody. Thank you, Lord. Amen? No matter, how, no matter how educated you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how much talent you have, the, he leveled the playing field. You ever know what he did in the Old Testament with the sacrifices? He says a bullock for this and a bullock for this. And he says if you don't have that, then you can do this. If you don't, he made provision for everybody in the socioeconomic stat, uh, uh, ladder. He, he, made it, uh, he made it accessible for everybody. He says if you don't have turtle dolls, then just get you some flour. Because if, if, if you're, if you're uh, well enough to just have a meal, you can have a sacrifice to take care of your sins. Isn't that funny how the Lord does that? What a blessing, man. It's almost like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves it's a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast I've given you the illustration before my grandfather was 74 years old and I walked into his living room an unsaved Catholic man been excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church for getting a divorce said you can't take communion until you pay the church $3,000 because you divorced your wife You see that? They believe that, they, they believe that the communion is how you get saved. So you know what they just did? They said, you either pay us $3,000 or you're going to go to hell. Do you see what the implications of what it is they told them to do? He, they hung them over hell and said, give us your money. Holy Mother Church. Yeah, they got other words for it. <laughs> Listen, I sat in his living room and I quoted those two verses right there. I said, Grandpa, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He looked at me, he says, and he called me Joey. He can call me Joey, you can't. <laughs> he said, Joey, that's your interpretation of it. And I said, Grandpa, listen to me. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, I said, now you interpret it for me then. If that's my interpretation, now you interpret it. And give me yours, based on what it said. You know what he did? He bowed his head and said, I don't know. And he died two months later. Alone in the world, without hope, without God. With no assurance of his salvation. Some of the greatest verses ever penned in the Bible. For by grace he is saved through faith. Not of yourself. And can't you just say hallelujah for that right there? Because if it was based on me, I'd mess it up, man. You ever just walk through life and realize how many times you mess it up? You ever walk through life and say, if it was based on me, just the thoughts that I had to fight in my brain on the trip over here, I'd have messed it up. Amen. Because Christianity is a fight that you constantly have to battle no matter where you are in life. But your salvation, we'll get into that in just a second, man. But your salvation is not of you. It is by grace. And the thing is, is what is the, the mechanism that allows us to access this great, this so great a salvation? He tells us the mechanism in which you access it is faith. Amen? 
Go to Romans, uh, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We'll, take, we'll run some verses here. Isn't this a blessing, man? Therefore, verse 1 of chapter 5 of Romans, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Look at this. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I'm giving you another call to action here. You ready? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. We'll start in verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Folks, if you don't have Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 memorized, and you've been saved more than two or three years... I'll say it again, and I don't mean to make you mad. Shame on you. How could you possibly effectively share the gospel with anybody and you don't know those two verses? So do yourself a favor. That would be the shame I give you tonight. It's shame on you, okay? Now, let's move on from that. Get it on a 3 by 5 card. Put it on your mirror. And make sure you memorize those verses. Those are four verses. You know what we've become lax in doing as Christians in the modern world? We've become laxed in working on memorizing Scripture. Listen to me. I know. I have a hard time memorizing. I, have a, I do too. One of the scariest things that ever happened to me in my life was when uh, they said they were going to ordain me down in Jacksonville. And uh, Dr. Peacock says, and you can't open your Bible. And he sent me the list of uh, questions, and then I got, a, I got another list of questions. And you can ask Brother Adam. We're driving down to Jacksonville. I've got three by five cards. I'm sweating. I studied for months. And I had to be able to give two to three references and quote the verse for any question they asked me on my ordination board. And for an hour, they grilled me with question after question after question. And guess what? The Lord helped me. I, I quoted every verse to answer every question they gave me. And I don't say that to be like arrogant and prideful. What am I trying to tell you? That took me months of practice to do that. If you asked me to do it right now, I couldn't do it. <laughs> right? I'm not in practice like I was then. Right? But you know what I've realized? The more I put it in, the more I try, the better I get at recalling it. And we need to be more familiar and and try to memorize stuff more. Listen, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You'd be surprised your victory over your flesh in your everyday Christian battle the more you memorize scripture on the things you struggle with. you got a problem with lust, then why don't you memorize some verses? you got a problem with different temptations, why don't you have 1 Corinthians 10, 13 memorized? Why don't you have it memorized? Right? If you got if you got uh, different problems with your tongue, how come you James chapter three? How come you don't know where James chapter three is at? How come you don't know some of them verses where the tongue is you know lit on fire, the fires of hell, and all those kinds of things? You should know. Listen, you should know what you struggle with, and you should know and look up verses on things you struggle with and memorize those verses. It'll help you. How did the Lord fight off the temptations when he was in the wilderness with the devil? He quoted scripture at the temptation that he was getting from the devil. Folks, it's the same defense you and I can have today. So, that's my little rant on memorizing verses here. (laughs) But what saith it in verse 8? He says here, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Now listen, um, this, uh, this... This right here disproves Calvin in the sense of, look at, he says here, that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. What is that? The word of faith. Forget limited atonement. He says everybody has, has, is, that the word of faith is nigh, it's even in their mouths. That's not selective in any way, shape, or form. Uh, how do you know that? Go to, uh, let me see here, I think it's Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, yeah, Acts chapter 5. Look in verse 31. 
Because this salvation that we're talking about, he says, Him hath God exalted with His right hand, verse 31, 531, Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be the Prince and a Savior for to grieve, uh, or excuse me, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Who's that to? That's to Israel. Okay? You say, what is, what is the, the benefit? He's, he's granting repentance to all of the Gentiles, both elect and non-elect. It's open to the Jew and it's open to the Gentile. Go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse number 18. This is the, they're, they're recalling the events of Acts chapter 10, which was Cornelius getting saved. And if you remember, what preceded that is the, is the dream that uh, Peter had with the unclean animals coming down in a big net out of the sky. And he says, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, Far be it from me, Lord, I've never put anything unclean in my lips, so on and so forth. And he says, What God had cleansed, no man shall call it unclean. And Peter's like, oh, well, what is this new thing going on? And then Acts chapter uh, uh, 10, Cornelius, a Gentile man who's been praying and seeking God with his family. The Lord comes by and grants salvation to Cornelius and, and everybody that's with him. And look at what he says in Acts 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. What is the significance of that? Is that he's trying to say it's open to everybody. And what is it? The word of God is nigh thee. In thy mouth. What, the word of faith. Every man has been given the measure of faith. You have enough faith. They say that you're totally depraved and you can't possibly, you can't possibly seek after God in any way, shape, or form. That's baloney. That's right. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely false. Every man's been given a measure of faith. And if you can get over yourself and your pride and your arrogance and say, you know what, I can't do it on my own. You have the faith. It's not even in thy mouth the word of faith. And, that's, and that, that'll give you access to the faith. 100%. It's important to understand that the final doctrinal statement of this age was given in Acts chapter 15. And this was a big ordeal. Acts chapter 15. If you understand the book of Acts, it will really help you to understand uh, the rest of Paul's writings. Because once you understand dispensations in the sense of how it flows through the book of Acts, it really helps you put everything together, whether it be in the Gospels or the Old Testament. And you can start putting pieces together in the New Testament. And you want to know something? All the verses in Acts and in the Gospels that people break their necks on and they try to apply it to you and it has nothing to do with you, it's because they don't understand what's going on in the book of Acts. And so in the book of Acts, if you understand the backstory here, you got Acts chapter uh, 1, that's the ascension, right? You have Acts chapter 2, that's the cloven tongues of fire, and Peter is uh, speaking in tongues there. And where's that? That's the first place you break your neck. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. What? And it's by speaking in tongues, repent and be baptized. And so every stinking uh, Pentecostal, crazy, charismatic person says that's how you receive the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. You see? But if you understand how that thing works through and you get up to Acts uh, uh, chapter 7 at the stoning of Stephen and then Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian unit gets saved. And then Acts chapter 9, Paul gets saved. And then what happens? Acts chapter 10 happens and you're Gentile, here's Cornelius, he gets saved. And it's like, what is going on? Paul is starting to do his missionary journeys with Barnabas and Barnabas has kind of given him some credibility amongst those and he finds himself in Jerusalem because he's been preaching the dispensation of the grace of God that God gave Paul on his own accord to which he said at one time, he says, and I conferred not with flesh and blood. He says, I got that thing from God and I didn't talk to nobody. And he says, he went, he went to Jerusalem to speak to the, to the elders at Jerusalem. You know what he was trying to figure out? He asked them the personal attributes of Jesus Christ. He's meeting with Jesus Christ's brother and that kind of thing over there. He wanted to know more about the Lord based on the doctrine that he had received. And so he finds himself at the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And this is where other people get messed up and they say that Peter and Paul were preaching two different gospels. No, they weren't. How do you know? Because of what Peter declared in Acts chapter 15. 
The final doctrinal statement that is given in this age is in Acts chapter number 15. Uh, look in verse... Um, we'll start in verse 7. The great, uh, the, 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 the great change of Peter's heart here, his theology changes. After hearing Paul uh, give his testimony and how he received what God had given him, verse 7, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's Acts chapter 10, right? We were just there. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as He did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What's the yoke He's talking about? That's the burden of the law. He says, we couldn't keep it, our fathers couldn't keep it. And Paul defined it when he said it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ to show us that sin was exceedingly sinful, to show you just how impossible it was for you to measure up to God's holiness. That's the purpose of the law. And that's not to say that the law is bad, because the Bible tells us that the law is holy, just, and good. It has a purpose. And what does he say in verse 11, the definitive verse here, the final doctrinal statement uh, on salvation for this age, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, the Jews, shall be saved even as they. Close the book, there it is. Now why would you try to, why would you try to get any doctrinal information about salvation preceding Acts chapter 15? Unless you were dishonest and didn't know how to read. <laughs> I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Maybe they were illiterate. Okay, go back to uh, Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians 2. Let's see here. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship. And thank God for that. He's still working on me. Created in Christ Jesus, and notice that term continually coming up in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, unto good works. Notice how all of the statements about salvation precede what he just said in verse number 10. So just so you couldn't get it twisted, the works came after salvation. You see how plain it is? When you stop trying to make the Bible fit your theology and just let your theology fit the Bible. What a simple concept that is, <laughs> right? Uh, for we are uh, His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, and then they go off the rails, <laughs> that we should walk in them. Give us some context. Go to Titus, the book of Titus. The book of Titus on this thing about God creating us unto good works. And you say, uh, well, what about, what about James when he says, I'll show you my faith by my works? Well, just like if you understand the book of Acts, you understand that James is another transitional book. And James being a transitional book, he's not talking to you in the sense of your salvation. He's talking to tribulation saints. He told you in the first uh, verse of the, of the entire book, he says, written to what? The 12 tribes scattered abroad. He told you who he's talking to. And we'll get into this in a, in a later study. And when we get into here and in, later in, the, in this where he talks about uh, in verse 19 of our text when he says they're fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. I'll show you the different, uh, the, I think there's eight different, there's eight different uh, groups that, are make, that make up the family of God. And it shows you that there's tribulation, uh, uh, tribulation uh, Jews and there's tribulation Gentiles. And, the, and, and, and how they get saved is totally different than how you and I get saved. All right? And we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, Titus chapter number 2, look in verse number 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Notice that. It's a pattern. 
It's something that you do all the time. It's not that I did one thing and now I have accomplished it. I have done my duty and uh, that was uh, all that I needed to do. No, it's a pattern of good works. It's a, what we talk about around here is it's called being faithful. What you have to, see, we're, we're programmed to think pretty short term. He's talking about long term. He says, your testimony of being uh, whatever it is you're going to be for Jesus Christ is not dictated on one thing that you do, but rather it's a pattern of things that you do over time. Right? Well, I was nice to somebody, but then you became a jerk the rest of the time. <laughs> you thought that that meant something? No. It's a pattern of good works. Showing thyself a pattern of good works. And then he says, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. All right? Now, this I'll allude back to what we talked about on Sunday when it came to this love thing and the ecumenical movement and how it's love, 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 love. If you don't have love without proper doctrine, that's not love. That's, that is tainted love. That is, that, is, that is unbiblical. Right? Now, um, again, it has to be rooted in doctrine. And the church today doesn't much care for doctrine anymore because doctrine is a natural dividing line that, uh, that separates people. But that's why Jesus Christ said, I don't come to send peace on earth, I come to send a sword. And the Bible says that we should earnestly contend for the faith, right? Now listen, I, I quote those verses not, uh, not to uh, give you license to be a jerk uh, or anything like that, because we'll get that over here in, in, in uh, chapter 3 of Titus when he talks about good works. And when he says, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Because we're good at arguing about stuff. But there are dividing lines that we don't cross because that's what makes us who we are. And when you start to, uh, you start to, you know, remove those dividing lines of doctrine, you now have tainted fellowship. And you've got to be careful about that. I was sitting in an olive garden one time. I don't even, I don't know how this stuff happens to me. I really don't. But we were in Indiana and uh, sitting in this olive garden between church services on a Sunday afternoon. This was many years ago. And I'm sitting there and I had some, uh, had some buddies with me. They had come up and visited me from Pensacola. And uh, literally, in the, in, we're in this booth, and the booth right behind me was this like uh, young guy pastor, something like that, with two teenage boys. And literally, he was talking them out of why the King James Bible is not the true inspired Word of God. And I'm like, how did I get in this booth? <laughs> I don't even know how that happens. How do I get in this booth? And they're in that booth. And at that point in time... I had my friends from Pensacola there, right? And I was quite younger than I am now. And, uh, and that was kind of like, they're like, what are we going to do about it? This is where you go to church. <laughs> yeah. And so it was kind of like a, there's a masculine thing going on. There was a little bit of that going on, you know? And so I remember I got, I mean, I just got about as full of it as I possibly could. And I remember there was, I mean, this place was packed out. And I got up and I, I just popped my head up over the back of that, that thing. And I said, excuse me, sir, I just, I just couldn't help but listen to your conversation. And I'm talking about this loud. And I said, it sounds to me like you're trying to talk these two young gentlemen out of why the King James Bible is the word of God. And he liked to swallow his Adam's apple at that point. You know, and, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. And, uh, and, he's, and, he's, and he's like, oh, well, the, you know, only the originals are inspired. I'm like, you don't believe that. He says, well, yes, I do. I said, are you sure that only the originals are inspired? Oh, yeah, only the originals are inspired. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm like, do you really believe that? Oh, yeah, 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 of course. And I said, well, what happened to Acts chapter 8? When the Ethiopian eunuch is riding the backside of a desert, and God sends him a man, and the Bible says uh, that uh, he turned unto the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And he was reading the book of Isaiah. 
And you just told me that all, the only way that it's Scripture, because only, all, all Scripture is given by inspiration. And so if only Scripture is given by inspiration, you believe the only Scripture that uh, is inspired is the original manuscripts. Are you telling me that that Ethiopian eunuch had the original manuscript of Isaiah on the backside of a desert? And he's like, well, the problem is, is you don't love me. <laughs> I said, sir, you got bigger problems than that. Yeah. I said, you're going to have to give an account for these young men. You're trying to talk out of the word of God up here. Yeah. And you know what the funny thing was? You say, well, you were out of line. You shouldn't have done that. Well, if you would have been there, you would have done it differently. Thank God I was there and you weren't. Yeah. <laughs> that limp the sucker got out of that thing. They got done eating. And he comes over to me and, and he was kind of embarrassed because <laughs> there was... I mean, this is an olive garden filled, and people are like, ooh. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, at least we can shake hands, because bless God, brother, we're both on the same team. And I said, I ain't shaking your stinking hand. And they say, maybe you should have shook his hand. At that point in time, I said, why would I shake hands with you when you're trying to talk to these? I was dealing with teenagers at the time. You know, I was one of those I was one of those kids that used to think that and God showed me the truth. And I said, and you and, and I said, you were you were shown directly from the Bible something that you could not refute. We're not on the same team. I'm glad you're saved and you're going to heaven when you die, but the Lord will ring you out when you get to heaven someday. And don't think that, oh, we're just going to show this entire place that we're on the same team. Listen, you're saved, I'm saved. That's as far as it goes. I'm not going to erase the dividing lines. And, and listen, he started it, I didn't start it. <laughs> right? That's right. Amen. Hallelujah for that. Would I have handled it differently now? Probably. <laughs> Been more gracious, uh, but I was young back then, and sometimes the zeal of a young man can get a hold of him, and he says different things and does different things, and I un fully understand that. But uh, he says, showing all things, uh, show, uh, and all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. He says, in doctrine, in uncorruptness, another place he's he said, without partiality, to be corrupted. To have your own preferences or have your own, uh, have your own uh, benefit in mind when you're trying to do good for people, that's a corrupt work because you're ultimately trying to benefit yourself. Okay, you're trying to use people. Sometimes a lot of nice people, a lot of smooth talkers, they compliment you. What, is, what, is it, what does Proverbs tell us? He says, you see somebody with flattering lips, you know what they're doing? They're setting a net for your feet. Now be careful when people start talking nice to you and buttering you up and, oh, I've never heard somebody preach as good as you. I've never seen somebody so knowledgeable than you. It's like, what angle are you trying to get at me from? What? And I, you just hold your wallet at that point in time. You just figure out, what's this guy up to, man? Knock it off. We don't, normal people don't talk like that, okay? All right? And he says, uncorruptness, gravity. What does he mean here? Gravity. How serious you take this thing. I think Brother Spurgeon said it when he's praying. And this is a, we take it seriously. What do we take, take it seriously? Our service for God. The things that we do, the choices we make in our life, the little things, not just the big things, but the everyday things. What do we do? We take it serious. There's a time to be, you know, uh, cut up and there's a time to, you know, kind of lay back and have a good time. But bless God, when it comes to the decisions of your life and how you live your life and the pattern of good works that you have, you better take it seriously. Why? People are watching, man. People are watching you. God's watching you. Some people, like I said on Sunday, just a little too loose nowadays. Just take your life, just a little too loose. Too familiar. You know? I remember one time I was down in uh, Jacksonville and Dr. Peacock called me in during a jubilee or something. He was uh, telling me I was going to preach. And I went into his office and uh, he says, Brother, you're going to preach uh, the next one up. I'm like, okay. Walked out the door. He says, Brother Biano. And I walked in, I'm like, what? Man, I got chewed out. <laughs> I got chewed. He's like, what? 
You just cut them off, say, what? What? Like, that's like no big deal? What is that? Because you, you never tell your superior officer what. You say, yes, sir. You say, why is that? You're too loose with the authority that's above you. You're too loose. How about that one, man? <laughs> the reason you say, yes, sir. You can go up to your superior. I remember when I was in the sheriff's department. I never went to my sergeant and said, hey, how you doing? I said, sergeant? Right? I didn't address, I didn't address my sergeant uh, in, in some disrespectful, loose way. We get too loose. All right? He says, and then sin, uh, sincerity. Sincerity. To be sincere. To be genuine. How about this one? To be real. To be real. Just a genuine person. Not putting on a face. Not putting on a show. Just be yourself who God made you to be. Best you can. And you know what will happen? The more you try. Have you ever got to a point where you, you honestly meant something a one way, but somebody took it another way? You ever been in that situation before? And you're like, and you feel horrible. You're like, I didn't mean it that way, but they took it this way. And then, you know what you can do? You can immediately say, you can go up to them and uh, you could do this. This is what a lot of people do. They go, well, I'm sorry you took it the wrong way. You see what just happened there? That's the most unsincere apology you've ever made in your life. You want to know why? You say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for it to come off that way, but obviously it did. And that is not what I meant, and I really apologize that you took that, that uh, it came off that way. That's not what I was intending, and I need to work on that. You see that? What is that? That's being sincere. Sometimes, in order to be sincere, some people say, well, that's just my personality. Okay, uh, change your personality. How about that? <laughs> that's just who I am. Well, I've been that way my whole life. Then change. Then stink and change, man. Why would you want to stay the same? Well, I just, I, you know, I did this for years. I'm from New York. I still do it. <laughs> I'm from New York. Honestly, folks, if you could see me <laughs> so long ago, I have, I have come a long way, and I know I still got a long way to go, and I'll tell a lot of you guys sorry. I just, I just apologized to Brother Jerry a couple, a couple uh, about a week ago. I apologized to Brother Jerry. I said, but I didn't mean to make you feel that way. I'm so sorry. You know what? It's because sometimes I just, I'm in another, I got a bunch of stuff in my brain. I got a bunch of stuff going. I'm processing a bunch of different things. And then I, I could say something. I could come off a certain way. That's something I need to work on. And if the Lord puts you in a place of leadership, you need to even be more aware of it and work on yourself even more. It's called being self-aware. And if you can learn how to do that and tweak things, you'll come off as a sincere person. And when your good works, you know what will happen? God will put them on a megaphone. God will put them on a megaphone and you'll start helping some folks. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Watch what comes out of your mouth. That he that, is of contra- uh, that, that he that is of contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Man, could you imagine to have such a pattern of good works? The Bible says that even your enemies are at peace with you. Right? Boy, that's the, kind of, that's the kind of good works we're talking about. Look at verse 14, same chapter. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Notice that again, this is a process, just like we just talked about. It's a process. It's a trial and error. What's he doing? He's redeemed you from iniquity and he's trying to purify you so that you become zealous of good works. You know what you find out? When you show kindness like the Lord showed kindness to you, when you have a pattern of good works in your life and you start seeing how that affects other people, you know what? You become addicted to that feeling, man. Some of you, if you lack joy in here, try to be good to some folks. Go out of your way to try to be good to some folks. Be more giving. Be more kind. Be more gentle. Give more compliments. Try to be that kind of person that's a wind in somebody's sail, not an anchor to their feet. And you watch you become zealous of the, you'll start seeking out opportunities because it's like, I like, because you know what? You want to feel God say, add a boy to you or add a girl or whatever. <laughs> you start being good to his people and God will start being good to you. And man, he'll just pat you on your back and say, that was awesome. Appreciate you doing that. I don't know about you, but I, I, I love getting an add a boy from God. 
I do. He doesn't give them out all the time because if you give them out all the time, they lose their, they lose their, their power. But man, you start doing stuff and you have a pattern of good works every now and again. The Lord comes up, just nestles up next to you and says, I see what you've been doing. I really appreciate it. And I'm telling you, that's all you got to hear. And you're like, Lord, that lights your soul on fire, man. You know, your joy will be peaking like, you know, like crazy. Last one, and we'll go and we'll take some prayer requests here. We're only eight after ten, okay? This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, and that they which uh, have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Good and profitable unto men. Uh, people always say, I want to make a difference. You live in a country right now uh, where a lot of people, you know what, they're what we call do-gooders. Do-gooders are some of the most dangerous people you ever met in your life. Because if, you if you're trying to be a do-gooder without God, you'll make a mess real quick. You'll make a mess real I don't, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Look at every one of these uh, bleeding heart um, politicians out there, and we need to take care of the homeless, and we need to feed these people, and we need to feed this. Off the back of who exactly? Oh, so you mean you'd rather, you'd rather raise taxes and you'd rather raise this and raise that and take it out of the pockets of folks that are working hard to give it to the people that aren't working very hard and you don't want to have any kind of limitations on, or, 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 or uh, um, expectations for how these people should do if you're going to give them all this different stuff. You're just a bleeding heart wanting to do good for everybody at the, at the expense of everybody else. Why? Because you just want to make a difference. That's godless. You don't think, you know where Marx got his, Karl Marx got his teaching, don't you? Acts chapter 4. Because everything comes back to this book. They sold everything and had all things common. You ever read that in Acts chapter 4? Where did he get it from? It wasn't an original thought. <laughs> Them bleeding hearts. We just need to make sure that everybody, it's not about uh, uh, it's, it's equity and equality and all this different stuff. I'm not being political tonight. That's an ideology that's permeating your society today. And you need to understand, guess what? There was a time in this country that the relief to the poor and the relief to the needy came from local churches and bodies of believers that people were a part of. And they, and they, and they invested their lives and they built their lives around. And when people came up on hardships, folks in that church came up together and helped them out. But now the government wants to be your new church. And, they'll, and you know what they'll do? They'll prey on your fragile emotions. Well, the government can do it. And then they relieve the burden off you. And now what do we, we live in a place now where everybody that wants something calls the church as if we're supposed to give them a handout. But they don't want to commit to the church and they don't want to give their life to Jesus Christ and be a part of the church. And they're using it like an ATM. They're using it like they, they want to take food stamps from the government. They've been programmed to think that way. Off of what? People trying to do good without God. They don't want to do it God's way. So, what does he tell you? You follow some of these principles here in Titus when he talks about being zealous unto good works. You know what you'll find out? If you maintain a good pattern of good works and a close relationship with Jesus Christ, you, you'll do more good for, for mankind than they'll ever dream of. I don't care how many boxes of food or clothes they send to, to Haiti or whatever it is that they, they, they send there. They throw money at problems. You know what? I remember going to Africa and seeing the needs over in Africa and watching those kids eat one meal a day and beans and rice and beans and rice and beans and rice. I watched them as they graduated the eighth grade and they had to kick them out of the school onto the streets of the Kalangwari slums in Nairobi. I remember watching those kids and listening to at the, in the middle of the night banging on the door because they couldn't get back in because they could only keep them up to eighth grade. You say, what did you do for two and a half weeks in, in Africa? We didn't, we didn't come over there with pallets of food. We didn't go over there. I, we did raise money for water and all that kind of stuff. We did. We, we tried to meet some of those physical needs, but what did we do? We gave them the word of God the best we could. That's what we gave them. 
Because what good if you supply the need for their belly and you supply the need for their physical, but then you neglect their spiritual? Which one's more profitable? You see? He says here, if you have believed in God, he might be careful to maintain good works. Why? Because these things are good and profitable unto men. You want to make an impact? You want to make a difference in somebody's life? Then guess what? Live a life that exudes the goodness of God. Live a life that is dedicated and sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be quick to give an answer for the hope that lies within you with meekness and in fear. And you know what you'll find out? You may just leave a trail of fruit behind you that you had no idea God could even do because you were doing good in the right way and you didn't neglect God out of your good works. And some people may get a meal bought, and some people may get some bills paid, and some people may get some needs met that they need along the way. But guess what? Never let them take the, the physical without knowing who it came from. That's right. Amen? I want to do good. You want to do good? All right. Well, that's how, he, that's how you do it. That's the mindset behind it. All right, let's, uh, we'll just read this one verse, and then we'll close up. For tonight, we'll take some prayer requests. He says here, back in Ephesians chapter number 2, uh, man, I, didn't, I literally didn't get, get a third of the way I thought we were going to go tonight. Uh, For we are His workmanship, verse 10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Heavenly Father, thank you again for tonight. Thank you for these that have come out. Hopefully, what was said tonight would be a blessing and a help and encouragement uh, Lord, that we just do a little bit more uh, for you in these last days. We sure do love you and pray that you'd bless this now prayer service. And we ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right.